building. And we're attempting to raise $5,000 to match a donor, anonymous donor, who's offered us $5,000 if we can raise $5,000 from the community. Mm -hmm. And we started this two weeks ago. We announced it on Front Porch Forum and our newsletter. And I'm pleased to announce tonight that we're more than halfway there. <laughs> We've got a little over $2,000 to go. And we have until November the 1st to raise that money. Well, that's one of the stipulations of the match. So if you're so of a mind to present us with a gift uh, for that purpose, all you have to do is, you can do it by PayPal, actually, on our website, or you can write the check off to box 329, Twister, and we'll receive it with gratitude. So thank you for your presence tonight. Let's enjoy this tonight. Welcome the Bacons to Worcester. Thank you, David. Sure. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad to see my Worcester uh, family here, you might say, uh, and I welcome you to the Vaudeville Retrospective, uh, the illustrated presentation that takes a look back at the exuberant form of entertainment that was uh, so prominent on the cultural landscape of uh, our nation uh, in the early part of the 20th century from about 1880 to 1930. In fact, you can regard me as your tour guide as we use vaudeville kind of as a prism to take a look back at all the social and cultural and technological changes that were happening in the early 20th century that have still have so many ramifications today i mean it has a uh, it's long gone right kind of died out in the 1930s motion pictures took over the depression and so on we'll be talking about how that transition happened but the influences of uh, early 20th century vaudeville are still with us today, sometimes in uh, the most uh, unusual and uh, unsuspecting places, but uh, they still do remain. Now, as a mere youth of 75, <laughs> what authority can I bring to this subject uh, that came and went long before I was born? Well, uh, I do have a little bit of a 
personal experience uh, with it, uh, and also a little bit of a family uh, uh, experience uh, with it too, through my, my father who d did some performing, my grandmother who uh, grew up in Plainfield and whose family goes back to the 1780s in Callis. Uh, uh, she was a, a silent movie house pianist and a walking encyclopedia of uh, American music. Uh, so between my father and my grandmother, uh, I have a, a little bit of background. I, I knew some of these songs uh, from the time I was, probably I learned them in the womb, probably. Uh, uh, but uh, I used to play among my grandmother's uh, shiny sheet music on the floor, you know, and nobody could walk by because they'd go flying if they stepped on it. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there was my grandfather of the Richardson family. He was a, a child of... Uh, Herbert Weeks and Elvira Richardson, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, a little bit more about that uh, later on. But uh, also, what other authority do I bring? Well, uh, for 35 years, uh, I uh, was I had a uh, ardent and demanding career as an acrobatic juggler, a comedy dancer, and uh, uh, a jazz and ragtime musician. Uh, and, you know, flaming torches on high unicycles, you know, all the cheap sensationalism uh, uh, associated with that, and all the travels and all the uh, eccentric people and geniuses. Uh, so uh, along the way, I became a, a scholar of some of that uh, early 20th century, uh, some of those early 20th century specialties, uh, my juggling specialties. I wind up write a, writing a couple of books, but then, of course, Old acrobats don't last forever, you know. Uh, here I was uh, approaching 60 years old and I thought, you know, maybe I should back out of this and uh, get out of this business before I break my neck <laughs> instead of uh, waiting until it happened. So uh, I made a proactive decision to go back to graduate school and get some credentials in the museum and history field. and. Uh, have been working in the museum and history field ever since I uh, closed the book on commercial show business when I was 60. But I was able to keep all that uh, going somehow until I was 60, which is about, uh, well, what, about uh, 16 years after Tom Brady uh, hung it up? Oh, come on. <laughs> Big whoop, man, is what, what I say. Big whoop. You know? uh, so the, the, rest is, the rest is history, I, mean, I guess you might say. And one component, I've, been, I've worked for a, a, a regional uh, history and museum organization, but uh, this presentation I put together is one component of that history work uh, where I can, you know, stand here and talk about this without having to do it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and, uh, so that's, uh, that's the uh, genesis of this uh, presentation. But along the way, I will tell you that when I first started doing this, well, still a few years after closing the book on show business, I still had a number of our longtime agents. Uh, when I say our, uh, I worked for 23 years on the road with my sensational juggling partner, my wife and partner, L.J. Newton, right there. Uh, you can, you could, say, you could say we spent 23 years making a living throwing things at each other. You know? And, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, I'm still proud to state that uh, we regaled audiences in some of the finest theatrical palaces across this land. But uh, LJ continues to keep me grounded by uh, reminding me constantly that we also played some of the biggest dumps uh, across the United States, you know, dormitory basements, uh, muddy fairgrounds, uh, you know, the whole thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, shortly after I closed the book on commercial show business, there were these agents that kept calling me to try to drag me back in, you know, with, you know, try to lure me back in, you know, well, it, you know, are you going to say no to this? You know, I said, yes, I'm going to say no, and you know how I'm doing it? I'm putting together, the, I decided then I would try to put together a program of vaudeville retrospective 
that was so all-fired academic and dry that no show business agent would ever want to book it. <laughs> so, so that's what you're going to see tonight. It's about, as, it's about as dry as I can make it. And, you know, along the way, as we talk about the economics and the technology, I will insert a few little tidbits from the former stage repertoire. Not for lowbrow entertainment purposes, however, <laughs> but merely to illustrate the flavor and the effervescence of uh, uh, this live entertainment that was so dominant on the uh, uh, theater stages across the country. So, so there we go. So let's get started. I, I'm pretty, is it possible for history to be more fun? I mean, uh, I, I get pretty excited about it, I'll tell you that. So, here we are, a vaudeville retrospective, the last living vaudevillian. You'll notice the critical word is as the last living vaudevillian. <laughs> so what was it? I mean, it's, it began and ended so long ago, it's in hardly anybody's experience now. So uh, let me define it for you. It's a pretty simple concept, really. Uh, it was a theatrical presentation of variety acts, acrobats, jugglers, uh, monologists who, you know, talked and, you know, were maybe, maybe were very serious or were maybe somewhat droll uh, or maybe hilarious, uh, dancers, singers, uh, etc. Uh, the type of people who you might see on TV if there was a program that was entitled America Had Talent. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of misconceptions uh, associated with uh, early vaudeville. Uh, there's the misconception that uh, it was somehow, uh, somehow conflated with uh, blackface minstrelsy. Well, that's not the case at all. The blackface minstrelsy, it did have a... Uh, several decades of vogue, but it uh, really had uh, faded out uh, by the time vaudeville became a major industry. Yes, there were some performers that did use blackface. There were some black performers who used blackface, uh, uh, but, uh, and that, uh, uh, it, it did fade out from vaudeville, but a as you may know, it continued uh, for a long time in, in little pockets. In fact, my grandmother, uh, Edith uh, King Weeks. Uh, she, uh, among, in addition to playing the piano at movie houses for silent movies, she also was a, uh, a theatrical uh, assistant for community groups that wanted to put together uh, blackface minstrel shows of a uh, cast of uh, community members here in Vermont. Uh, a drama group did it. Right here. Probably, I wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, it doesn't surprise me uh, in the least. Uh, the other misconception is that, that it was uh, across the board mediocre. And that was uh, something that was introduced uh, in the Hollywood movies uh, that had a, a theatrical or, you know, show business theme. It always seemed like the vaudevillians were these over-eager people who uh, would stop for nothing just to get some sort of a laugh and they always wore some loud plaid jacket and a, you know, a, a stupid grin. Uh, I guess it's the victor that always writes the history, right? So, uh, so all of the uh, Hollywood types were uh, kind of making fun at the, uh, at the lower class of vaudeville. And the other, the other misconception was fostered by uh, successful show business personalities who had made the transition from vaudeville to radio to television or movies. And uh, these were people who never let the truth get in, in, in the way of a good story. And they loved to uh, tell stories about their struggles, uh, you know, uh, contesting rats in the dressing rooms. Uh, you know, so they all had all of these uh, uh, stories that uh, perhaps exaggerated their rags to riches, uh, you know, accomplishment, but uh, it made a better story. But it did, uh, uh, today, uh, even young scholars who were studying this subject uh, 
they can't get away from these misconceptions either. You know, so they have a, a tough place to start from. Uh, setting the scene, as we go through this uh, program, we'll be setting the scene for you, uh, talking about how it uh, expanded into these uh, networks, and we'll also be talking about the decline. There was a combination of internal forces uh, and external forces. And we'll talk about some of the people, some of the people who were household words. Uh, you may have these uh, names in distant memory, or they may be total strangers to you, but they won't be after tonight. You know, they'll connect up with what you do already know, and by the time you wake up tomorrow, your lives will be improved incrementally uh, <laughs> with uh, um, just more wisdom and more knowledge in general. Uh, and then, okay, then what happened after vaudeville fizzled out? Did these people just go into chicken farming or did they, uh, you know, sweep floors in the uh, department store or, or what happened to them? We'll be talking about that. And then the 21st century manifestations. Uh, so let's see what's next. Okay, a dominant form of leisure between 1880 and 1930. What it was not, as I was mentioning, not blackface minstrelsy. It was not the risque burlesque of the 1930s. Uh, actually, uh, vaudeville networks and the, the people who managed them had strict uh, code of conduct. I mean, you couldn't say damn or hell uh, on a show. Uh, if you did, you might have a whole 42 weeks lucrative season canceled. But of course, artists are always trying to push the limits, right? So, you know, if the manager happened to be out to lunch, either figuratively or literally, uh, you know, some artist, a clever artist, would uh, uh, try to push the limits. Like there's that song in the 1920s, she looked like Helen Brown. And then there's, a, you know, a two-person comedy act who might, uh, you know, the, the schoolmaster or the, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, slow student where the schoolmaster says, Johnny, where the subject is vocabulary and I need you to use the word horticulture in a sentence. And little Johnny says, uh, you can take a nice lady to a museum, but you'll never take a horticulture. You know, they try to sneak, they try to sneak these things in, you know, uh, when the manager wasn't around, but uh, it was kind of risky. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, it wasn't always a struggle, uh, and it was certainly not marginal. Let's take a look. Oh, marginal, you suppose? There's Pro uh, Proctor's Pleasure Palace in New York City in the 1890s. So, uh... You can see it certainly wasn't marginal uh, in New York at that time. Survivors to the TV era. They're a long gone now, but uh, anybody who uh, uh, watched the, the tube in the 1950s or 1960s even, uh, and you probably might have even seen Bob Hope uh, doddering around uh, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, George Burns, of course, he had a contract in Las Vegas to, to keep performing until he was 100 years old. But these are the ones that made the transition. Uh, they were successful on radio. Uh, they were successful uh, on television. Now, uh, quite naturally, uh, some of the other performers in vaudeville uh, are the trapeze artists going to hang in there for another 20 years? Uh, I can tell you no. <laughs> okay, now we have a growing middle class, so it's a, a, a big opportunity for a, a middle class leisure. So when this vaudeville formula of a, a variety show worked out in Boston and New York, other entrepreneurs tried to get on the bandwagon and it was a perfect timing 
because you had, uh, in the late 19th century, you had expanding rail networks, you had urban trolley lines, so people could be uh, more mobile within the cities, and these national railroad uh, networks, it was easier to distribute the performers. Uh, it went along with the gains in the distribution of goods uh, of any kind. So these entrepreneur and communications with improved telegraph and then the beginnings of telephone communications, these entrepreneurs could base themselves in one place in New York or Boston or Chicago uh, primarily uh, where the clusters of uh, talent uh, acts were and uh, they could uh, form these uh, vaudeville bills of six or eight acts and schedule them on a, a very efficient tour uh, regionally. So at the peak of vaudeville's popularity, because of all this, you had uh, in the early 1920s, you had 2,000 uh, palatial theaters across the United States, an additional uh, one or 2,000 other venues, uh, some of them seasonal in parks at the end of uh, a trolley line, for example and 30 to 50,000 performers uh, working around in everything from big time to small time vaudeville. And here are the visuals. You have uh, B.F. Keith's Theater in Syracuse, New York, uh, devoted to high class vaudeville. It was torn down in 1967 uh, for a parking lot. months before I arrived for my freshman year at Syracuse University. <laughs> and now below you have the Lewiston uh, Empire Theater in Maine. Now you think, a fairly small city, Lewiston, Maine, well this theater had 1,200 seats. Vaudeville, six nights a week. That was also torn down for a parking lot. And then you have the vaudeville stage uh, at the uh, seasonal attraction at the end of a trolley line in Salisbury Beach, Massachusetts, which probably blew down at the end of every year, and uh, they just rebuilt it. Okay, how about close by? Every place I do this presentation, I try to do some sort of a, a research, even if it's just in a cursory manner, uh, about the local theaters that uh, did feature live entertainment in the early 20th century. So here in, uh, in Montpelier, you have uh, Blanchard's Opera House on the second floor of the Blanchard Block, uh, right on Main Street. Uh, it opened in 1885. It was called Blanchard's Opera House. You probably know that a lot of town halls incorporate uh, uh, in northern New England incorporated opera houses uh, within the structure, uh, but it's, uh, it's unknown if any opera was ever performed at any of those opera houses, uh, <laughs> but they were called opera houses. And LJ and I uh, worked at a lot of them, <laughs> trying to get your equipment up stairways about this wide. Uh, Anyway, this uh, opened in 1885. It did have minstrel shows there. Uh, it had 800 seats, 600 on the floor, 200 in the balcony. And it closed in 1910 and was converted to a telephone company switchboard center. So, you know, hey, technology is important, right? You just uh, elbow other things out of the way. Uh, and uh, down below here, you have the Playhouse Theater. Uh, I had that confused in my mind with the theater in Barrie, which was at one time called the Park Theater. But anyway, this, is, this is the, was the Playhouse Theater on State Street in Montpelier. You may recognize it, the photo that's now called the Capitol Theater. Uh, it opened in 1916 uh, for live entertainment, uh, also uh, sharing the bill with some short silent films. And uh, it did so until 1932, uh, when in those years after the depression uh, of 1929, the stock market crash of 1929, by 1932, 
a lot of these theaters all across the United States were, were converting uh, their uh, uh, theaters to show movies only because at the time the economy was such that showing movies was a lot cheaper than paying these pesky uh, human uh, individuals. Uh, so uh, it went on to just uh, to show movies. And uh, it was uh, severely damaged in the 1938 hurricane and then after recovering from that there was a fire in 1939 and it was rebuilt as the Capitol Theater for movies only. And how about in Barrie? You have the Barrie Opera House. Now there's a pretty palatial place, I would say. Uh, that was uh, opened in 1899 with a thousand seats. And uh, it had uh, quite a long run of live entertainment, vaudeville entertainment, uh, uh, plays, musicals. Uh, but from the 1930s to the 1940s, again, after the stock market crash and those early depression years, it operated solely as a movie house, uh, closing in 1944. Uh, it was restored in 1982 and uh, still uh, hosts live events. How many people have been to the Barry Opera House? All right, everybody's been there, yeah. I think my grandmother, Edith King Weeks, played the piano at the Barry Opera House. Uh, the Park Theater in Barrie, uh, that opened in uh, 1915 with a thousand seats, a 1920 fire, rebuilt in 1921, but again, since 1932, it was, uh, it's shown movies only and was renamed as the Paramount Theater. But th th this uh, wasn't the only story here for, uh, for uh, traveling shows and in live entertainment. How about the circus? Traveling circuses in north central Vermont. Just scan all those names. Uh, if, if you were a circus historian, those names would all stand out to, to you. Uh, Barnum and Bailey was here for six different years uh, between the 1890s and uh, 19 teens. Uh, Ringling, and this was before Barnum and Bailey combined with Ringling Brothers. You have Ringling Brothers itself here in Montpelier in 1905. And it was uh, only uh, in later years that uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey combined their shows. And they were here in Montpelier in 1956 with their Tented Circus, which was one year before they uh, had their final performance under canvas and went to solely performing in arenas. Of course, that's not on the list here, but, and uh, Hagenbeck Wallace, Downey Brothers and Sparks were actually the same circus, the same management. But there were others, uh, other traveling shows in the latter part of the 19th century. But I will say that uh, Vermont uh, had a lot of resistance to uh, traveling shows. The Vermont State Legislature in 1825 passed a law uh, prohibiting uh, traveling menageries <laughs> because they thought that such an uh, amusement uh, would uh, detract from the uh, industriousness which uh, makes Vermonters uh, so proud, right? And uh, a lot of these uh, producers got around it by instead of calling their traveling show a menagerie, they decided to call it a circus. So then in 1848, I think it was, uh, the state, legislator, uh, state legislature uh, passed a law prohibiting juggling, ventriloquism, <laughs> magic, uh, circuses, uh, and said that they were a, uh, uh, a public nuisance and, uh, you know, a, a drag on civilization, basically. Uh, but uh, they, what they did do was they left the permitting to local control. <laughs> so when they left it to local control, well, okay, come on in, you know. Uh, there was probably some more to it, more to it than that, because you know, all of these shows had what are known as fixers, you know, who would... Uh, try to grease the path of this show uh, in various ways. So, 
Anyway, by the 1880s, there were all these traveling shows, and I guess the, uh, the law just uh, kind of became irrelevant. What was a typical show like, a typical vaudeville show when you went to a theater? Well, you'd have eight to ten acts of eight to twenty minutes each. You'd start off with a dumb act, an acrobatic or animal act. Now, that has nothing to do with your SAT scores or your uh, IQ. Uh, it meant that you worked silently uh, to music. And it was a great uh, uh, type of act to have at the beginning of a show or the end of the show while people were rattling their seats and you know, shuffling and you know, taking off their hats and uh, jackets and, and muttering and murmuring. Uh, uh, they didn't ha you didn't have to deal with uh, uh, misunderstanding the uh, a vocal or verbal act. Uh, second act was usually a, a partner song and dance act. Uh, the third, a comedy sketch, or maybe even a serious uh, play with uh, notable actors and actresses. Uh, then a novelty act, or eccentric comedy dance act. Uh, and then a big name act to close the first half. Somebody that had already an established reputation. And then an intermission. And then, uh, again, while people are shuffling their seats to get back after intermission, you'd have a big orchestra act or a choir or an animal act that performed to, to loud music. And then the big star was always at the position that was called next to closing, the headline vocalist or comedian. And then to close out the show, you'd have a flash act like a juggler or a tumblers or a trampoline act or something, uh, which would be, uh, be called a chaser. In other words, to clear out the house uh, uh, so they can get ready for another performance. And that, again, was a, was a dumb act uh, that did not uh, use uh, any verbal comedy or anything like that. But you know, all this talk about dumb acts kind of makes me think about some of my specialties. <laughs> but, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That didn't come out quite right. <laughs> but I think it's time for me, uh, I'm probably overdue to make uh, that uh, transition uh, to, uh, you know, the effervescent vaudevillian uh, instead of the uh, professorial bore. <laughs> so we'll get rid of this jacket. That can just go right over there. I think we're ready now. Let's see. Uh, let's see if we can get the maestro to strike up the band. All right, maestro. Hit it.
And now I have the appropriate utter silence <laughs> for true artistry. That's something I learned from my father. He always said, don't bow like the boy next door, bow like Toscanini. <laughs> well, after that, how in the world can I resume my dry academic <laughs> demeanor. It's hopeless. <laughs> well, let's see where we're at. We'll get the projector to come back to life. Oops, we don't need that view. There we go. Okay, you're probably wondering <laughs> about the presenter. How did he get this way? Well, three decades of performance, encouragement from lowbrow audiences, uh, and uh, the wonderful, dazzling synchrony of my wife and partner, LJ. Ah, those were the days. But there's, uh, I mentioned briefly before, there's always the family. There's my dad, Wesley H. Bacon, who uh, had uh, several different specialties. He was a sleight of hand manipulator in the late 40s when smoking was cool and he was, his specialty was manipulating cigarettes. You know, in a tuxedo, in a nightclub with, uh, you know, dreamy music and he'd be out there. So it was all very elegant. Uh, then uh, years went by, and he was pursuing uh, another career. And he decided to take up escapes in the tradition of the great Houdini. So Hardini was the contraction of his two favorite escape performers, uh, Harry Houdini and his brother Hardin. And he wound up doing a... Uh, this act for uh, quite a number of years. Uh, he, he would uh, roll around in, on the stage floor in a straight jacket and uh, he'd get out of mail bags and uh, he studied locksmithing uh, so he'd know all about locks. Uh, 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 yet he was the uh, type of performer who uh, once he was off stage 
you'd never know he had anything to do with performance. The quiet, retiring, and cerebral. <laughs> I had so many great mentors in my early years of performing. You have Otto Person here, who was a great unicyclist. Uh, Herbie Weber on the tight wire, he was quite an inspiration. I still have the tight wire up in my backyard, but ask me how, much, how often I use it. <laughs> Been there, done that. Uh, and then Albert and Mina Solstrom uh, from Denmark, uh, great jugglers. You can see Albert doing, uh, his wife is, is juggling three clubs, uh, and Albert is doing a leapfrog over her back and stealing the clubs all seamlessly. Uh, he was great. And then you have, uh, no, not pictured, but you have Edith King Weeks, uh, the walking encyclopedia of early 20th century music. But how about the next page here? Ah, family roots in Vermont. Okay, this is something I can talk about. Here you have my grandfather, Elton Weeks, a child of Herbert Weeks and Elvira Richardson. Uh, a whole, uh, you know, five or six other siblings, and uh, I was at the cemetery uh, visiting uh, as many as I could find uh, briefly today. But Elton, he was... I was, I really lucked out between my father, philosophical, cerebral, and Alton, who was your, to me, it was like the prototypical Vermont, uh, taciturn, uh, tough as nails uh, character. And so I had both of those uh, influences growing up. And, uh, well, Alton. I don't know how uh, well anybody uh, knew Elton here because he, he was born in 1895. Uh, he was born in Callis, but his family moved, lived in Worcester for a time, lived in Callis for a time. And uh, anyway, he, uh, he married Edith, who was from Plainfield. And in the late 1920s, they moved to East Middlebury where he ran a general store. Uh, now, he was tough as nails, but he also, uh, during the Depression, he was a compassionate and uh, winds up extending, whoops, he winds up, uh, where are we? There we are. He winds up uh, extending uh, too much credit uh, to some people up in the hills that were, uh, you know, having a tough time during the Depression, and he, he closed his store in 1940 and moved to Connecticut. So by the time I knew him, you know, in the 50s, he was, you know, 40 or 30 years removed from Vermont. And of course, Vermont uh, has continued to change through the decades. So the values that he passed on to me were from his own particular uh, 1910 time warp. Uh, so I got uh, all of his stories about uh, his logging when he was a young man and skidding logs out of the woods and his great pride he took in uh, uh, handling a horse team to skid logs out of the woods. And he was, uh, he taught me how to swing a sledgehammer and an ax. And I remember when I was about two years old, he taught me how to swing a hammer. He'd get a, a bag of walnuts and he'd give me a, a carpenter's hammer, you know, and he'd uh, sit me out while he's working in the basement or in the yard. He'd sit me out on a square of pavement <laughs> outside the cellar door, and I'd be there like two years old. Ah, you know. <laughs> boom, boom, you know. Hey, the, it's, it's just, just like the juggling, you know, you have enough repetitions, okay, you finally get it down, you know. So I cracked a lot of walnuts, you know. Uh, and then, well, he was. I could probably go on, but you know, in order to uh, uh, gain, uh, you know, a, a professional level pro proficiency with uh, even some of the juggling that I was just doing there, uh, to do that, it takes thousands of repetitions, right? And it takes quality repetitions. It takes a concentration, and I certainly got that concentration from my dad, but. 
to not get discouraged if something got too hard. That's all out in there. There was nothing that was too hard. If you thought something was too hard, if he ever discovered you thinking that something was too hard, uh, you'd get some sort of sarcastic remark. You know, uh, he was great at that sarcasm. In fact, uh, uh, how about this? I, this is going to be my uh, one of my survey questions here. He had a lot of Vermontisms from his youth that he carried right through uh, till his dying day in 1982. And uh, I remember one time I was out playing ball, and I was a sports crazed youth. I was out playing ball with a neighbor's kid, and I see my grandfather come out in the back, his house in Connecticut. And, uh, you know, he's got a, some trash he wants to put in the trash can, but of course the trash can's kind of full, so, hey, what do you do? Do you just say, oh, I, it doesn't fit? No, of course not. So, I do the same thing right now when I'm uh, working in a yard, and, you know, I, I just put my leg in the bucket and uh, stamp it down, right? So, he's trying to stamp down the uh, trash in the t old craggy metal trash can. And uh, the trash can tips over while he's just jumping up and down in the trash can and it gouges his leg. And I'd never seen so much blood. And I go, oh, oh, oh. And he says, what are you gaping at, boy? Twant nothing. Now, my question is, how common is that contraction uh, of it wasn't uh, a twant? <laughs> Anybody here ever heard twant? Yes. Twant? So, yeah. So if something gets hard, you know, or, you know, you have a little difficulty, twant nothing. So I guess maybe you've heard enough about uh, Alton. Uh, but, uh, and here's Alton Weeks in Callis in 1920 uh, with one of his prized uh, horses. And over on the right, you can see my uh, grandmother, Edith King. Uh, she is uh, descended from the King family that uh, was in Callis from uh, about 1810. She's also descended from the Wheelock family that uh, skidded their belongings uh, to Callis in 1783 uh, from uh, around Worcester, Massachusetts uh, in mud season. And uh, I think there's still a little monument where they built their first cabin. It's all overgrown somewhere in, in Callis now. Uh, and several years ago, uh, I was up here and I, I met the town clerk in Callis. I wanted to do a little genealogical research about the Wheelock family, uh, that she's also descended from and I'm descended from. Uh, and uh, I went there on Saturday morning hours and uh, she was talking to some other fellows that uh, had some issue with permitting and, and I just sat quietly in the corner waiting my turn and uh, I could tell she was sort of an irascible lady. I think her name was... Uh, uh, Pat Morse. You remember pa Pat? Eva. Eva Morse. That's it. That's it. Eva Morse. Okay. So, Eva Morse, she seemed sort of an irascible lady. And I, you know, hey, I've been around the block. You know, I'm, I, I, uh, I try to grease my path. You know, uh, I don't want to upset this person. And uh, so I was just quietly as a mouse sitting in the corner. Uh, waiting and I know the hours it was getting late and it was getting co towards closing time and she had the town clerk's office uh, like in the uh, uh, garage uh, of her house or something uh, and the two other fellows leave and I tell her uh, about my uh, uh, quest and she goes back into the inner recesses somewhere and pulls out these pencil written notes from some local historian from you know, 1820 or something and uh, lets me go through them and copy them and then she pulls out some reprints of a, a book on the Wheelock family history that's some real rare book 
And then she says, what do you got on your feet? <laughs> uh, well, you know, okay, maybe they were running shoes or something. She says, eh, they'll do. And she says, you want to go see the wheelock, uh, you know, where the, where the cabin was? And I said, oh, sure. And uh, I get in her pickup truck, she takes me, and we go, we go bushwhacking through the high brush. And, uh, you know, it got really low and mucky, and finally we come, come up to this place, and she, and she said, oh, we can't park here because uh, these people, uh, you know, we got to park where these people don't, uh, you know, get uh, upset with us. Well, anyway, we found the place, I took a bunch of pictures, came back, and I said, boy, that was really beyond the call of duty. And uh, she said, well, it's all right, your family. And she says, besides, you didn't irk the clerk. <laughs> so, so I got home. I mean, I thanked her profusely, and I got home. And you know, my first career was as a journalist, an editor, and a designer, a graphic designer of publications and stuff. So I, uh, I designed this sign. I got the from the internet. I got the. Uh, Callous town seal and everything. I made this sign, you know, town clerk's office, you know, suitable for framing, you know. And in big block letters, I put, don't irk the clerk. <laughs> you know. And I wrote a, a thank you letter for, you know, taking such time, you know, uh, after she'd closed her office to take me bushwhacking through Callous. And, uh, so I sent her this sign, and, and uh, she sent me a letter back, uh, and she put, put this sign uh, in her office, you know, so if you went to see her, you'd see this sign over her shoulder, <laughs> don't irk the clerk. I love it. I understand she did pass on, uh, I don't know, 10, or year, 10 years ago or something like that. But uh, anybody know Eva Morse? Oh, yeah, okay, great. Great. So, okay. Oh, really? Well, if she's still around and you see her, tell her uh, uh, I'm still not irking the clerk. So, I'm praising the clerk. So down here you have uh, Herbert and Elvira in their younger years and Amanda Hurlbert and Alonzo Richardson, who lived, uh, Alonzo, he was one of the many that lived up at the end of uh, Minister Book Brook Road, and Martha Chapman and Arza uh, King, who were uh, the grandparents of my grandmother, Edith. Mm -hmm. Reg, yes. I just will interrupt for a second here. We have Dennis Martin, all right. And lives up where, and that's the where All right. So you probably know the story about I, about how I, how I with my my 15 year old son, went to visit uh, your dad, George Richardson. And we went up there. It's in our book. It's yeah, it's in the book. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I. In fact, I I was telling Bruce about it today. I said that uh, my son and I were hiking on uh, Mount Hunger from the other side, and we got up and we could take a picture, and we saw the open place that was you know, cleared for the farm. We took pictures from the top of uh, Mount Hunger. Then on the way down, I called Audrey and Jim and said, say, you know, hey, we just climbed, climbed Mount Hunger. So we uh, went down around and back up and uh, visited Audrey and Jim, and uh, before we left, uh, Audrey said, you know, you've got to go, you've got to go see George Richardson, you know, he's, you know, that's the, that's kind of the homeland up there in Worcester, and uh, you got to go see George Richardson, so my son and I are driving by, and it's a school day the next day, and I, well, we ought to just keep going, but then we get to Minister Brook Road, I said, you know, 
man, I it might not be up here for a while. Let's go up and at least take a look. So we go up and then we realize it's at the very end of the road. And if you don't have some business up there, uh, what the heck are you doing there in the first place? So I thought, oh, geez, uh, we've got, I've got to go to the door. I mean, uh, you know, I don't want somebody to set the dogs on me, you know. Uh, so uh, I get out of the van. And before I can get too far close to the door, out comes this man. And I said, say, are you George Richardson? You know, trying to be as uh, open and non-threatening as possible. He said, that's me. Take a good look. Oh, no. <laughs> I, th I think I got a little out of What I said was, I said, oh, you're George Richardson. Audrey and Jim said I should come and see you. And then he said, well, take a good look. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that sounded like something uh, my grandfather Alton would have said. And like, okay, maybe I should, good to see you, bye. You know, but uh, at that point, another pickup truck came up. And this man that I had met at the uh, History Expo in Tunbridge, maybe one or two years before, gets out of the truck. And I said, oh, hey, I remember you. And I, I, I've, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Gordon. Gordon. That's it. So Gordon gave me a little legitimacy uh, <laughs> with your dad. And a after that, it was... Uh, uh, my son and myself, Gordon, and your dad all went in the house. We sat there, and your dad was the most uh, welcoming person, and he had a gazillion stories, and he was pulling out all these notebooks and scrapbooks uh, uh, that had all the family history, and he's, he's uh, there, there's your mother's uh, birth recorded here, and, uh, you know, so it's all, all right there. And uh, I thought he was a pretty inspirational guy. It seemed, I saw him go into the next room and bend down to get one, a book off a low shelf. And I thought, boy, I hope when I'm 80-something, I can you know, go down like that. Uh, yeah, but it was, uh, it was great. Uh, and then, OK, maybe you can clear up a, a mystery from years ago. I don't think I included this. Maybe I did in the, that uh, little essay. But uh, when my son and I were there, we were sitting at a table in the kitchen and piled high on the table in, you know, uh, sealed plastic bags were these scrumptious looking oatmeal cookies and uh, other kinds of delectable things that, uh, you know, and we're looking at these and, you know, whoa, I don't know who made these, but wow. So, uh, uh, do you happen to know uh, the source of those? Well, I may have made them. I'm not sure. It would take a lot of cookies to bring up to my mother. If they were molasses cookies, I know they would have been from me because I used my mother's recipe. Oh. So I'm not going to bring them up there. Did you bring it too far? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, maybe that was it. Maybe, they, but they were, they were, uh, they looked, it looked like it had to have been a very recent delivery because if it wasn't, somebody would have broken into those bags before I stole them. So now you know, probably you know why I'm here. <laughs> okay, vaudeville beginnings from the concert saloon to refine vaudeville. Well, the first American circus uh, was presented in 1793 in Philadelphia. And, of course, there were a lot of wagon shows and traveling circuses uh, through the early part of the 19th century. And all this uh, uh, gave vaudeville some shape uh, in the 1860s with the uh, concert saloon. Uh, you had the, uh, uh, the, the food, the drink, uh, low-end theater, prostitution. Uh, it was all happening in these uh, what were called concert saloons. I remember I was giving one presentation uh, several years ago, and I, I mentioned the low-end entertainment and the music and the 
food and the drink and the prostitution and some fellow from back in the audience says, what a night. <laughs> uh, uh, well, anyway, uh, New York City started to crack down on these uh, concert saloons. And uh, at the part of the, uh, during this crackdown, there was this fellow on the right here, Tony Pastor, who was a theatrical type, an actor and producer. And uh, he uh, uh, got the idea to uh, capitalize on this crackdown by uh, p offering shows for a general family audience. And that really uh, shifted the uh, uh, trend. And he opened uh, the Tony Pastor Theater in 1881, and he became uh, qu quite a success. And all it takes is one person to have such a success, and you have a lot of others that uh, try to follow suit. So there were changing times that all uh, facilitated this. You have the technological uh, change uh, with expanding industrialization. What did that do? It caused a great population shift from rural to urban. Expanding transportation networks, I mentioned that earlier. Expanding communication, advancing, uh, advances in printing and technology. Uh, they could uh, advertise in magazines and newspapers. Uh, print these uh, uh, fancy program books and posters. Sound and music recording, of course, that also created an audience for some of these performers. And motion picture technology, even in the beginnings of motion picture technology, uh, they were incorporated within, into vaudeville shows in the 1910s, for example. Uh, social change, you have population growth with immigration uh, to fill a lot of these jobs uh, uh, caused by this uh, development of industrialization. Uh, you have a growing middle class, and there was also that backlash against tastemakers that said, oh, it's a, you should only pay attention to European classical music, or you should only pay attention to uh, a high art. Well, uh, this growing middle class uh, didn't want to be told what to do. And there was also increasing participation of women in the economy and in political and social issues. Uh, a lot of vaudeville shows were offered in the afternoon so women after they were shopping could uh, pay a nickel or a dime and uh, take their children and, and go in and see a performance. So of course uh, you have these thousands of performers. You have a whole industry here of, of, uh, uh, from theater construction to uh, uh, costume designers to uh, uh, people who built uh, steamer trunks for the uh, uh, traveling performers. And then, of course, at the top you have all these uh, uh, moguls and masterminds, uh, some of whom were uh, greedy tyrants and some of them uh, were saints. Uh, a few of them, uh, like uh, Fred Proctor over here on the left, uh, he was a performer himself and was very sensitive to the needs uh, of performers so that they could uh, give their best uh, every time they went out there. Uh, Edward F. Albee up there in the upper right, uh, uh, he, they were, uh, he was uh, described as someone who had the heart the size of a flea. Uh, <laughs> And you have uh, Sylvester Poli, uh, who was an uh, immigrant from Italy, came to Connecticut, and he had 30 theaters in uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts. He was a sculptor, but uh, he wasn't uh, making it with high art and uh, sculpture in Italy. So he comes to the United States and he winds up uh, uh, carving wax figures for a wax museum. And uh, he gets a good education in, uh, you know, the flow of the box office, <laughs> and he gets involved in uh, bo uh, owning theaters and booking theaters and selling tickets for vaudeville. Uh, and then uh, you have Michael Shea, who owned a series of uh, theaters near Buffalo, New York. Uh, one of them at downtown Buffalo. Still, it's one of the most palatial theaters uh, uh, that remains from the vaudeville years. Big business, it became an industry. 
how do you, how does that compare to uh, uh, the Capitol uh, in uh, Montpelier? Uh, that's the B.F. Keith Vaudeville Theater in Cleveland. So you had the, the winning combination, the rail transportation, communications, printing, publicity, uh, an eager audience, talent aiming to please, and tycoons aiming to profit. But it was the talent that made it all work, even though they had to deal with a lot of these uh, 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 hard-nosed, oops. There we go. The talent that made it all work. Song and dance acts, comedy, novel. Anybody recognize any of the people there? That is Fanny Bryce. If I had a wooden nickel, I'd toss it your way. <laughs> uh, that is George and Gracie. And uh, George Burns is uh, in another photo as well. Uh, this is George Burns with the seal. His, his early partner, Flipper. And this is Will Rogers here on the left. Oh, sure. And this is Harry Houdini covered with the pigeons and the rabbit. Uh, uh, Noble Sissel and U.B. Blake up in the upper left. And uh, let's see, Professor Lamberti uh, with the uh, uh, xylophone. Joe Cook on the Rolling Globe. Eugene, Eugene Sandow, the strongman act. And on the far, on the lower right, the one dog band. <laughs> and Bobby May up in the uh, upper right, in the uh, fabulous uh, world renowned and world traveled juggler. And uh, in the center, a little character in that uh, trio in the center. Uh, was a young Buster Keaton. And uh, up here, this dancer, that is Ray Bolger, who was later the Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. And even though I'm not seriously old, LJ and I were once on the bill with uh, Ray Bolger. And he, he was still kicking over his head. It was amazing. And here are some of the people. May Irwin, she was Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of Laughter. Uh, she was a, a, a real big deal uh, in the early 20th century, in the 1890s, early 20th century. And then W.C. Fields, the, the eccentric juggler, he worked as a silent act, uh, a comedy juggler, uh, no speaking at all. Uh, uh, for about 15 or 17 years of his career. Uh, but of course now we remember him for his uh, laconic uh, humor and his movies. Bill Robinson, Ethel Waters. Of course he had all the, Bill Robinson had all those movies with Shirley Temple. He had a very understated uh, approach to tap. Ethel Waters, who introduced so many songs that we call standards of the American songbook today. Roy Smack, the Wizard of the Strings. I have a guitar here that I'll play later that was designed by Roy Smack. And Cliff Edwards, Ukulele Ike, uh, who was uh, another uh, household name in the 1920s and 30s, who uh, premiered dozens of songs which we call standards today. He sold 75 million records between 1919 and 1956, uh, but uh, unfortunately he died penniless. He was, uh, he had, uh, he had to support four ex-wives that uh, did a trick. Uh, so then what happened? My goodness, then what happened? They thought it was going to be vaudeville forever, but there was that combination of external forces and internal forces 
that I talked about early on. You have the external forces, the novelty of sound movies, the younger audiences, established distribution channels for these movies, more leisure choices, and then that, uh, that external force of the uh, stock market crash, and then the, the hard fact that it was cheaper to show movies than to deal with these uh, pesky, demanding uh, human performers. The internal forces, the older executives, uh, they were resistant to change. Uh, the acts became imitative instead of creative. Uh, Edward F. Albee, that guy with the heart of a flea, was finally ousted in a hostile takeover by a fellow by the name of Joseph P. Kennedy. Oh, you've heard of him. Yeah. Well, it seems like he was, uh, he never really had any interest in theaters, except he became infatuated with an actress by the name of Gloria Swanson. And uh, it got him a little more curious about the business. And uh, he, d he decided to, to, to buy stock in a couple of these vaudeville networks. And uh, eventually, he accumulated enough stock that he could, it was, a, it was a, a deal, it was a, a deal he worked up that he winds up forcing out one of the creators of the Keith Albee network, uh, Edward F. Albee. Edward F. Albee dies about a year later and about the same time that uh, uh, Joseph P. Kennedy's uh, infatuation with Gloria Swanson ran out. So uh, after this hostile takeover, it was probably less than a year that Joseph P. Kennedy sold his stock, but not before dropping live performance from all of these networks of theaters that he controlled and retrofitting them for showing movies. They took out the stage of a lot of places. They brought in new audio, uh, the, the hottest and greatest new audio uh, features so they could show the sound movies. And uh, so you have this combination of uh, in external forces that led to vaudeville's demise and the internal forces and uh, the wheeling and dealing of Joseph P. Kennedy that uh, really uh, put the damper on uh, vaudeville in the early 1930s. But, uh, you know, there were performers that still continued on, my goodness. And uh, I think it's time right now to continue on because, you know, some of these performers that even when uh, the, the theaters kind of ran out of steam, it didn't mean that uh, uh, these uh, specialty performers uh, had nowhere else to work. Certainly not. There were all these uh, physical performers that had other venues. So I'd like to do a little medley of some of these skills that you might have seen in vaudeville and even in the 1930s uh, afterwards. So hit it, maestro, here we come.
now then. All right. Now then. Now we have the appropriate silence. All right. We have the ball. We have a club. We have a dangerous object. <laughs> we also have, in fact, let's toss this aside. Let's use another dangerous object. It's dangerous if you don't have one when you need it. <laughs> now then. <laughs> all right. Should I move? No, no, it's all right. It's all right. Lights. OK, I'm going to turn on the lights now. OK. Ah. <laughs> Twant nothing. Cheap applause, please. <laughs> All right. Hey, this is really the hard part. <laughs> That was the hard part. <laughs> but let's see, we, we're getting to the climax. Just think all that wisdom you've accumulated so far about the internal forces and the external forces and et cetera, et cetera. Well, then what happened? Okay, 21st century manifestations, of which I was one. Uh, the nationwide circuit of two a day is gone, but uh, within the performers, though, uh, the spirit remains. As far as I'm concerned, uh, just the packaging is different. Uh, in the 1930s, the top tier talent that were uh, cast aside uh, by the closing of a lot of these uh, live performance venues in favor of movies, uh, they moved into nightclub review and uh, or film or radio work. Uh, the lesser talent went into small time vaudeville, uh, left the business or retired. Uh, the top vaudevillians in the 1940s who were still active uh, and the younger variety artists, they had a, a ready market for USO shows uh, to entertain the military as a part of a uh, morale building uh, uh, service. In the 1950s, there was a, a great uh, boom of uh, uh, nightclubs in, uh, in the large cities. Uh, for so many of these uh, service people that uh, you know came back from their uh, war service and were uh, out looking to relax and meet people, uh, so there were that was those venues were uh, quite uh, uh, 
they, they were quite popular with the public and uh, the, the booking agents certainly uh, supplied a lot of acts for the, those venues. From the 70s to the 90s, well, there was a loosely defined uh, new vaudeville uh, that took variety to the people uh, on, at festivals and on the streets and whatnot. And I, I'm just thinking right now, does anybody uh, remember, did anybody attend the New England Vaudeville Festival when it was in Montpelier in the, in the 1980s? For several years it was in Montpelier and there was a parade uh, that, uh, they blocked off the whole street, came down the main street, turned down. Uh, in fact, LJ and I did performances uh, on a stage that was set up on the State House steps uh, back in the 1980s. And uh, in the parade, uh, I was featured in the parade on the unicycle uh, going right through uh, the main intersection there, uh, juggling the whole time with a champagne bottle balanced on my head uh, as I went through. Uh, and I didn't drop them all over the place like I've been doing tonight. Uh, those are the days, you know. But, uh, you know, people will hear this and they'll say, oh, I wish I could have seen your performance. You know, you're retired. Oh, gee, I wish I could have seen it. And I say, well, we knocked ourselves out for 35 years. Where the heck were you? You know, come on. You had your chance, right? Uh, so in the by the 1990s to the two 2020s, you have a new amalgam of circus and cabaret performers uh, with, with new packaging, really. Uh, I look uh, and I have coached a number of performers in more recent times, and, and yeah, the shows that they're working in, a different, different premise maybe, uh, different wardrobe, uh, different music, but the blood, sweat, and tears that these performers go through to achieve, uh, to uh, attain the level of proficiency it's the same, and it's the same uh, kind of dedication that the performers in ancient Egypt, uh, you know, uh, had uh, developed. So it's just a new packaging. In fact, here is a famous acrobat, Ben Dova, Joseph Spa, uh, in the 1920s, and right next to it is a more contemporary photo from Cirque du Soleil. There's not much difference there. Uh, it's a, the same kind of a dedication. Yeah, the, the, don't know their name. That is a big difference, and that's one of the reasons why uh, uh, a lot of performers of my generation, uh, we certainly love the talent, but uh, there's a lot of performers in my generation who would never have taken a contract with Cirque du Soleil because it would just put them out of commission uh, you know, you become uh, an anonymous uh, role player instead of a, you know, instead of a, a feature act that, you know, you can build a career on. So uh, let me, uh, you know, music always played a big deal in uh, vaudeville, and I haven't played any music yet. How, how could that be? Well, you know, in the early 20th century, In the early 20th century, what instrument was it that was so evocative of early jazz and ragtime was the tenor banjo. And this is a tenor banjo from the 1920s. I'll do a little medley here of tunes that uh, will take us from about 1899 into almost 1930. And then I'll take you a little further on and uh, tell you a little bit about how, uh, how this uh, music not only was popular in New Orleans and Chicago and New York, but even made it into more rural areas. But how about, uh, let's go right back to 1899. When we think of ragtime today, we think of pianos, right? And the effort in the last 30 or 40 years to elevate piano ragtime into a, uh, the classical realm 
Uh, it's kind of overly precious. But actually, uh, when this music became popular at the turn of the century, it was the ragtime songs that made it popular and the syncopated singing. So here we go. Got more troubles than I can stand. Ever since ragtime has swept the land, I've never seen the like in all my days. Everybody's got that ragtime craze. Stood it just as long as I could. At last I've got it, and I've got it good. At first I didn't want any in mind, but now I'm right in line. I got a ragtime dog, I got a ragtime cat. A ragtime piano in my ragtime flat. I wear ragtime clothes from hat to shoes. I read a paper called the Ragtime News. I got ragtime habits, I talk that way. I sleep in ragtime and I rag all day. I got ragtime troubles with my ragtime wife. I'm certainly living the ragtime life. My baby, hello, my ragtime gal. Send me a kiss by wire, baby. My heart's on fire. If you refuse me, honey, you'll lose me. Then we'll both be alone. Oh, baby, telephone and tell me I'm your own. Okay, let's go to 1918. Well, I went to a dance with my sister Kate. Everybody there said she danced so great. I realized a thing or two. Kate was into something new. I looked at Kate, she was in a trance. I realized it was in a dance. That must be why the guys are going wild about my Kate's dancing style. Yes, I wish I could shimmy like my sister Kate. She can shake it like a jelly on a plate. Uh, my mama wanted to know right now, why does everybody treat Kate so nice? Oh, everybody in the neighborhood knows Kate can shimmy and it's understood. Well, I may be late, but I'd be up to date if I could shimmy like my sister Kate. Oh, yeah, if I could shimmy like my sister Kate. Yes, I wish I could shimmy like my sister Kate. Yeah. She can shake it like jelly on a plate. Uh, mama wanted to know right now. Why does everybody treat Kate so nice? Oh, everybody in the neighborhood. I know it's Kate could shimmy and it's understood. I may be late, but I'd be up to date if I could shimmy like my sister Kate. Yes, sir, if I could shimmy like my sister Kate. Okay, how about 1927? Here we go. She just got here yesterday. Things are different now, they say. There's been a big change in the town. Gals are jealous, there's no doubt. Still the fellas, they rave about sweet, sweet Georgia Brown. Where's my basketball? Ever since she came, everybody claimed no gal mate has got a shade on sweet Georgia Brown. They all sigh and want to die for sweet Georgia Brown. They all sigh and want to die for sweet Georgia Brown. I tell you just why. You know I don't lie. Not much, but it's been said she knocks them dead when she lands in town. It's a shame since she came how she cools them down. Well, fellas that she can't get are the fellas that she's never met. Well, Georgia named her Georgia. Sweet, sweet Georgia Brown. Thank you. But you know, thankfully, it was a uh, radio that uh, you know made this music made this music uh, have a national appeal. So how about in more rural areas? Sure, it was big in New York and Chicago, but 
How about in more rural areas? Well, I don't know, musicians here? Any musicians? Uh, you know, some of these uh, songs will have the same, uh, some of these uh, early jazz songs or the songs written by uh, New York uh, City Tin Pan Alley composers uh, use a very similar and repeating uh, chord progressions. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of, uh, how about, uh, the musicians will know it as numerically as the one three six two five progression. That makes sense for anybody. One three. Yeah. All right. Well, some people would call it among musicians. It's often called the Jada progression, right? You remember that song, Jada? See, it's like when I talk about this music now, it's like uh, talking about a, a dead language, you know. But uh, that's the way it is. So you know, Jada. Jada, 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 jing, jing, jing. Jada, oh, jada. Jada, jada, jing, jing, jing. So, so many songs had that same chord progression. Well, Uncle Dave Macon, one of the big early stars of the Grand Ole Opry, he worked with a guitarist named Sam McGee. And Sam McGee was facile enough and uh, musically... Uh, uh, savvy enough that uh, he took uh, a number of these songs, a number of these chord progressions, and uh, made songs out of them that uh, might resonate more with a rural audience. Like this one called, I've got the milk em in the morning and feed em, milk em in the evening blues. <laughs> I got the milk em in the morning and feed em. I got the milk in the evening blues. I've got a cow out in my barn. Ain't worth the cud that she chews. I'm up every morning before anything stirs. I get slapped in the face with a tail full of burrs. I got the milk in the morning and then I feed them. Milk in the evening blues. Yes, I got the milk in the morning and feed them. Milk them in the evening blue. Well, I don't know why I don't sell you, except for the money I lose. You put your foot in the bucket, knock over the stool. I swear I'm going to swap you for a blue nosed mule. I got the milk in the morning and feed them. I got the milk them in the evening blues, yes, sir. Milk them in the morning, milk them in the evening, milk them in the evening blues. Okay, where's that horn section? This was the jazz age, remember? In the morning, and then I feed them. Milk them in the evening blue. Now look here, dear old bossy. I'm really gonna tell you the news. Well, you know, I love you so much it hurts. So come on, bossy, just one more squirt. I got the milk them in the morning and feed them. I got the milk them in the evening blues, yes, sir. Milk them in the morning. Milk them in the evening, milk them in the evening blues. Thank you. Milk them in the evening blues. Now then, such kind attention on a night when you could be uh, curled up somewhere with a, a good book or something and you're out here uh, listening to, to this uh, uh, 
vaudeville historian in a dry academic presentation. Well, you know, I always like to uh, make sure that I, I give people a, a choice. You know, I just don't keep on and on and on. So uh, let, me, uh, let me just uh, remove that distraction. Because I brought out here my uh, high-tech applause meter <laughs> so I can, uh, you know, determine uh, where you might want to see this go in the next few minutes here. Uh, so, <laughs> try as I might to make this uh, academic and dry presentation, uh, I am failing. Uh, so, uh, I guess we'll just uh, step out of the way here and uh, you'll see on the table, well, let's go over here. You see on the table, uh, we have uh, more juggling balls. We have another staple of the 1920s life, the banjo uke. We have the Museal and Westfall musical saw. And why, oh, my goodness, there's uh, there's probably some other things we could uh, indulge in here, but uh, let's uh, confine our voting to the uh, to an, maybe another juggling thing, uh, uh, or uh, another musical interlude with the musical saw or the uh, the banjo uke. So, first of all, all right, uh, another. Uh, juggling or manipulate, manipulative uh, exercise here. Uh, signal with your applause, please. Juggling. <laughs> All right. Uh, how about the uh, signal with your applause, please? The musical saw, if you will. thing still working? Yeah. Uh, the banjo uke. It appears it appears that the uh, musical saw uh, has uh, taken the uh, taking the lead here. Oh, let's see, where should I position? I'll position, uh, yeah, right here. You'll be. I guess the sight lines here will be okay for most people except right in the middle. <laughs> I love carrying this in a uh, viola case, you know, when I, you know, so people, and I just open up the case and they think uh, they're going to, you know, hear some uh, viola music and out comes the soul. Well, allow me to rosin up the bow here. Now the musical saw, it's a, just a, a, a novel instrument and I learned to play from a woman who actually was a vaudeville performer herself in her youth and she was the Pied Piper of uh, musical saw playing and uh, when I met her and all I had to ex do was express the tiniest bit of interest and she plopped me in a chair and she was hovering over me like an octopus, uh, instructing me on the musical saw. Uh, I could not refuse. Uh, but I'm glad uh, she, uh, she got me into it. Uh, wonderful instrument. 
It works great with a piano, musical saw and piano is a great combination. Now if you've never heard the musical saw before, it's, uh, it uh, can sound like a chorus of sweet singing ladies with a far too wide vibrato, uh, such as this. Now this is accomplished by, uh, there's uh, critical things. You have to ha maintain an S curve in the saw, otherwise you get no tone at all. So uh, this is probably another thing I would attribute to my grandfather Alton, uh, having the gr grip of a blacksmith. Uh, so you have to maintain that S curve in the saw. And you have to play, you're playing it by ear may, uh, primarily, but uh, your lower notes, the saw is in this position, your higher notes, uh, you're bending the saw over, but you have to maintain that S curve the whole time. And of course, it's a, you're drawing a, the bow across the blade of the saw. It's important to which side of the saw a blade you play. <laughs> Otherwise, you go through a lot of expensive bows. You wind up at the music store uh, more frequently. Uh, so, anyway. So here we go. Just a uh, just show you how the sound. Here's us without the vibrato. Now the vibrato is achieved by dragging the bow across the, the blade. And then at the same time, you start shaking your right foot up and down, like you've got some sort of uh, some sort of palsy, uh, you know, or some tropical disease or something that uh, is uh, making you uh, shake like this. And I've been told by some 90-year-old saw players that the vibrato actually improves with age. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. So what I'll try to do now, is, oh, I'll just play you a scale to show you just uh, what kind of range you can get from the saw. I like this instrument is this is the only instrument you can play a scale on and people will applaud. <laughs> taunt, taunt nothing. Okay, now I'm going to actually attempt to play a melody on this. Uh, you know, you wouldn't uh, uh, play uh, Franz Liszt's, uh, you know, manic uh, pieces on it. You wouldn't play Flight of the Bumblebee or something. <laughs> this is a really uh, an instrument more suited uh, to uh, calm, uh, slower tempo. So what I'm, I'm going to try to do right now is uh, Steve, one of Stephen Foster's favorites. They're way down upon the Swanee River, old folks at home. Here we go.
And there you have it, the musical saw, a wonderful instrument. And you know, you can get music out of a regular carpenter saw. Uh, you just uh, don't get quite the range, and it's a little bit uh, harder to uh, maintain that S curve in the saw, but you'll build up of your grip. That's, that's for certain. Let's wake this up again. Ah, we're getting right to the to the end, to the climax, where I'd like to do something that's really, I'd like to close out with one of my favorites. Uh, people often ask me, What's my favorite prop? What, what do I, what do I m like to juggle or with or what do I like to do most? So I'd like to close with this. Uh, the classic manipulation of the top hat and cane. You know, you have all of these stunts that I used to do on a unicycle or the rolling globe or the rollabola where you've got something balanced on your head and you got a ball spinning here. You know, and that's all great. It works. Uh, it works great for uh, 20 seconds, uh, but uh, when you're dealing with, uh, and here's a little piece of wi wisdom you can uh, fold into your knowledge about juggling. When you're dealing with fewer objects, you can actually do more and relate more to your audience uh, when you're dealing, when you don't have the sky full of everything that you have to pay attention to. So uh, I'm going to go back and see if I can strike up the band here and close out with the top hat and the cane. Okay, maestro. Strike up the band, if you please. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind attention. Glad to be up here in Worcester 
where I have uh, all this family history all around here. So thanks for coming. <laughs>